Not much background is required, but basic facts are critical to understanding what happened after the defining event. I'm Grant Oster. When I was in graduate school getting my master's degree in chemistry, I met Laura. I fell in love immediately. I think it took her six months, right before she got her master's degree in art history, before she fell in love with me. But it happened. Although I don't think any of us were particularly experienced, as far as I could tell, our sex life was excellent, and she never expressed any complaints. We got married less than a year after she received her master's degree and took jobs in the same city. She taught at a community college, and I taught part-time at a state university. I also worked part-time for a scientific consulting firm. After three years of marriage, I left university and worked full-time as a consultant. I became an explosives expert, and one of the clients I worked for was the federal government. Around the time our first daughter, Angela, was born, I was doing most of my work for the government, which required quite a bit of travel. I know it was hard for Laura, but I did offer to quit and take a full-time teaching position at a local college that had tried to hire me many times. However, Laura loved the money my job brought in and the lifestyle it afforded use. She encouraged me to stick with it. I can survive. I am self-sufficient, was her smiling mantra. My travels had not slowed down much by the time of the birth of our second daughter, Grace, two years after birth, Angela. I again suggested a career change, but Laura again insisted that I continue to work as a consultant since we now had an extra mouth to feed, clothe, and train. When the girls were five and seven, my schedule changed for a time, and with my help with childcare and after the girls started school, Laura decided to return to work. She took an administrative job at a local university, focusing primarily on the liberal arts college. For reasons I never really understood, but which I didn't care about because it made her happy, Laura developed a keen interest in photography. We have more than a dozen albums dedicated to our life with children. Another, at first glance, strange interest that Laura showed at that time was in other languages, and primarily Italian. Now there were times when Laura traveled for her work, especially to Chicago, where she had meetings with philanthropists, visiting professors and the Art Institute, as well as visits with Gina, her college friend, who was an exchange student from Italy at the time, but now worked in Chicago. When the children were eight and ten years old, terrorist activity around the world made my skills extremely valuable to the federal government, and I was hired to work for them full-time for two years. I discussed this with Laura for many hours before agreeing to the assignment, because it would have resulted in a lot more travel over the course of those two years, or possibly longer, and sometimes I would have been away for more than a month at a time. Laura encouraged me, telling me that she and the girls would miss me, but everything would be okay. Because of my job with the federal government, I was away for two Christmases in a row, when Grace was nine and ten and Angela was eleven and twelve, which was heartbreaking. Laura took the girls to visit Gina in Chicago. I spoke to them on the phone every day during their week-long visit, and they seemed happy enough. Apparently, Gina's relatives were visiting, some of them the girls had met before, and some were children about the age of our daughters. Finally, just before Thanksgiving, after more than two years on assignment providing expertise to fight terrorists, I returned to consulting full-team and rarely traveled. Laura continued to go out from time to time, usually about once a month for two or three days, mostly to Chicago, and I was happy to take on full parenting responsibilities for Grace and Angela when she was away, although they sometimes went with her. I think it's to be expected that girls become closer to their mother than to their father. Although I had a good relationship with Grace and Angela, they never really shared important things with me and they rarely ask my opinion about personal matters, although they always seem to share personal information with Laura. It didn't really bother me that much except for one thing. They had never, ever been as talkative as usual, talking about their experiences when they went to Chicago with their mother. Although they were not withdrawn about the matter, they never shared information voluntarily and often changed the subject with a laugh. It wasn't long before 18-year-old Grace went to college out of state while Angela. While a freshman at another out-of-state college at the time, Laura was going through a dark period. When I found her crying several times, I asked her what was wrong. She chalked it up to becoming lonely, 
She said she needed to go shopping with the girls in Chicago. The trip had been planned in a hurry and apparently required several long telephone conversations with Gina in Italian. Since I didn't understand Italian, I just accepted what Laura told me about the details. I had no reason to doubt her, although she had never been as whiny as she was three or four days before she and the girls left for Chicago. Laura returned from Chicago three days later more optimistic, although still not quite normal. However, this was not surprising. What was surprising were the few purchases the three of them returned with from their shopping trip. When I asked about this, I was told that some items would be sent later, including some directly to girls' college addresses. I did notice that my sex life, which was never bad, except of course when I was away for long periods of time, because I never cheated on Laura, was better once Grace left for school. I chalked it up to Laura and I, bonding as empty nesters, and I really liked that it started happening more often. Then the defining event in my story happened. One Thursday, I skipped work around noon without telling Laura who was at her usual place of work. I had planned to play nine holes of golf, but the rain put paid to those expectations. However, I was planning for our upcoming anniversary. I wanted to throw Laura a surprise party, so I talked to the event planner and got to work. Around 3 p.m., a courier arrived at the door with a wooden box marked Fragile, which he carried up the four main staircases of our home on a cart. The package was addressed to Laura. I signed for it, and with the help of the courier, we placed it in the living room in a stable position with the correct this-side-up orientation. I thought the delivery of the box was strange. I couldn't imagine what was in it. I looked at the return address and it said, Photography Studio Romano, followed by an address in Chicago that I knew was downtown. I called Laura at work and told her about the arrival of the box. At first she fell silent and then said, Oh, it's work-related. They should send this to my office. I think they made a mistake. Just leave it unopened and I'll get someone to help me take it to the office tomorrow. Normally, this would be a rational explanation, except for three things. First, complete silence on the other end for several seconds. After I first told her about the box, long enough that I almost asked, Are you still there? Since Laura is never at a loss for words. Second, the way she told me not to open it, it was more of an order than a request, and there was obvious tension in her voice as she said it, after working in counter-terrorism for several years, I learned by osmosis the importance of stress and nuance. Third, her entire behavior, not just the command not to open the box, was tense. My curiosity was piqued enough that I took a few photos of the box and entered the return address information into my laptop. The fourth thing that made me anxious happened as soon as Laura returned from work. After only a casual hello, she ran over to the box, looked at it, obviously she was checking to make sure I hadn't ruined it, and then was very vague and aloof when I asked her what was in it. I'm not sure exactly, but I expected to see some works from an organization in Chicago that wanted to organize an exhibition at my school. I'll open it and look at it at work. Do you want me to help and open it now? I asked, not only to be a good guy, but also to test her reaction. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, we need a uh, look at it at work to make sure there was no damage. In case, if insurance compensation is required, uh, the usually lively Laura stammered. The next morning before I left for work, two guys from the college where she worked showed up and carefully carried the box into the school van under Laura's careful watch. When I said, I can't wait to see the exhibition at school. When will everything be ready for you? It wasn't because I was really interested in seeing the exhibition. This was to test Laura's reaction. Without making eye contact, she replied, Uh, I'm not sure that's exactly it, but, uh, of course I will. We will. I'll let you know. Uh, uh, if we decide about the exhibition. Two stutters in less than 14 hours on the same topic from the usually fluent Laura. If it didn't pique my interest, nothing would. The fifth thing that pissed me off and made me suspicious was that Laura never said anything about the mystery box again. 
In the two weeks since the mysterious package arrived, I have learned most of what was publicly known about Romano Photo Studios. It was a business in the USA of a world-famous photographer, Pierrot. Romano is a man I've probably heard of at some point, but surprisingly, a man I'm sure Laura never mentioned, despite it being part of her photography hobby and her university job. She often talked about artists and photographers. Pierrot had a very original style. Most of his photographs were distinguished by both true photographic realism in certain parts and effects in other parts. He was considered a master of the traditional photographic effects of bokeh blur, panning, rule of thirds, and long exposure, often combining several effects in a single photograph. He was also the sole practitioner of a unique effect called Romano's artistry in his honor, which I understand loosely translates to Romano's artistry, but I have never seen it written in English, which no one else has, was able to reproduce and which is difficult to describe in English. My best attempt would be to say that it makes some objects super realistic, while nearby ones appear fuzzy, and with color changes if the photo is in color or shade within the same object. But this description is not true. Although most of the information about Piero was interesting from an intellectual and artistic point of view, two facts struck me. The person in charge of administration in his studio was his niece, Gina Romano Bianchi. I knew a friend of Laura whom I had met only once and never in Chicago. Her husband's name is Gina Bianchi. He died in a car accident on September 1st last year, and his memorial service in Chicago was held on September 6th, before his body was sent to his ancestor's burial site in Italy. What a coincidence that around September 2nd, Laura burst into tears, presumably because she was getting lonely and that Laura and the girls were on their shopping trip to Chicago from September 5 to 8. While I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm smart enough to have a master's degree in chemistry from one of the top 10 schools in the country, so I was able to figure it out. Despite how devastating it was for me, the only logical explanation was that Laura was having a real love affair with Piero Romano is at least 10 years old and that my daughters knew all about it. Another interesting fact, on April 16th, 18, three weeks after I learned this information, an exhibition of Piero's most famous and inspiring works, including those owned by private collectors, and some of which had never before been exhibited publicly, was to take place in Chicago. I was confident that Laura would have a business trip to Chicago around this time, even though the 18th was my birthday, and that the exhibition would most likely include the photographs that were in the box, delivered to our home two weeks earlier. Never in my life have I been so motivated to come up with a plan to deal with my cheating wife and traitorous daughters. Because of my initial anger, which I would have to suppress in order to accomplish what I wanted, I had to arrange a business trip for the night of the day. I learned the incriminating information and two nights later. I apologized profusely to Laura in a message I left on her work phone after I had packed everything we needed from our house for a three-night stay at a local hotel, promising to make amends. The first part of my plan was to have all the necessary divorce papers ready to file as soon as I had the evidence I expected. The second part was to find a way to get someone to attend the Chicago Exposition and film it on the first day of its opening, the 16th, which was by invitation only. The third part was to do everything possible to come out of the divorce with as much material wealth and money as possible. I no longer cared about my relationship with Laura and was very close to having the same feelings for Grace and Angela. The fourth part was the final reveng, including after the divorce was final. There were no problems with the first part. I received a recommendation from a good divorce lawyer, Gail Schiff. She advised me on everything I needed to do, and although she recommended that the basis be irreconcilable differences, she was willing to go along with long-standing adultery. Gail just needed some proof before she could file the paperwork, which I expected she would have on the morning of the 17th, and she could arrange for Laura to be served by a law enforcement agent, other than the county sheriff, and with the help of private processing server to record events, on the last evening of the exhibition, on the 18th. For part two, 
I collected as much information as I could about art appraisers with any connection to Chicago. I found a young appraiser named Roberto Milan who was trying to build his own business. I actually went to see him in Chicago and talked with him for almost the whole day. Although most of the information about Piero was interesting from an intellectual and artistic point of view, two facts struck me. The person in charge of administration in his studio was his niece, Gina Romano Bianchi. I knew a friend of Laura whom I had met only once and never in Chicago. Her husband's name is Gina Bianchi. He died in a car accident on September 1st last year, and his memorial service in Chicago was held on September 6th before his body was sent to his ancestors' burial site in Italy. What a coincidence that around September 2nd, Laura burst into tears, presumably because she was getting lonely and that Laura and the girls were on their shopping trip to Chicago from September 5th to 8th. While I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm smart enough to have a master's degree in chemistry from one of the top ten schools in the country, so I was able to figure it out. Despite how devastating it was for me, the only logical explanation was that Laura was having a real love affair with Piero Romano, is at least ten years old, and that my daughters knew all about it. Another interesting fact. On April 16, 18, three weeks after I learned this information, an exhibition of Piero's most famous and inspiring works, including those owned by private collectors and some of which had never before been exhibited publicly, was to take place in Chicago. I was confident that Laura would have a business trip to Chicago around this time, even though the 18th was my birthday, and that the exhibition would most likely include the photographs that were in the box, delivered to our home two weeks earlier. Never in my life have I been so motivated to come up with a plan to deal with my cheating wife and traitorous daughters. Because of my initial anger, which I would have to suppress in order to accomplish what I wanted, I had to arrange a business trip for the night of the day I learned the incriminating information and two nights later. I apologized profusely to Laura in a message I left on her work phone after I had packed everything we needed from our house for a three-night stay at a local hotel promising to make amends. The first part of my plan was to have all the necessary divorce papers ready to file as soon as I had the evidence I expected. The second part was to find a way to get someone to attend the Chicago Exposition and film it on the first day of its opening, the 16th, which was by invitation only. The third part was to do everything possible to come out of the divorce with as much material wealth and money as possible. I no longer cared about my relationship with Laura and was very close to having the same feelings for Grace and Angela. The fourth part was the finale revenge, including after the divorce was final. There were no problems with the first part. I received a recommendation from a good divorce lawyer, Gail Schiff. She advised me on everything I needed to do, and although she recommended that the basis be irreconcilable differences... She was willing to go along with long-standing adultery. Gail just needed some proof before she could file the paperwork, which I expected she would have on the morning of the 17th, and she could arrange for Laura to be served by a law enforcement agent other than the county sheriff, and with the help of private processing server to record events on the last evening of the exhibition on the 18th. For part two, I collected as much information as I could about art appraisers with any connection to Chicago. I found a young appraiser named Roberto Milan, who was trying to build his own business. I actually went to see him in Chicago and talked with him for almost the whole day. Roberto was generally familiar with Piero's work and was confident that he could get an invitation to the opening on the 16th. He didn't mind filming something I thought might interest me using the small, expensive, easily hidden HD camera I gave him, and he thought he might give it a good and high rating. What were the photos worth that I expected to be there? Some really experienced appraiser might be able to refute my analysis, but I would be happy to take on the challenge as it would help me establish myself as a real player in the world of art appraisal, were the last words that made me hire Roberto. For the parts three and four segments, I cashed in two bearer bonds that we had had in our safe deposit box for at least 12 years. I didn't remember if Laura had ever actually known about them, and she certainly wouldn't remember them now. Now they were worth about $25,000 together. 
For the other part of part three, I provided my lawyer with a complete list of all our assets, including the valuation of our home. I photographed all of Laura's jewelry and the entire contents of our safe deposit box, minus the bearer bonds, of course, and provided my lawyer with updated bank statements, credit card numbers, and outstanding purchases, retirement, and brokerage accounts. As a little snippet of part four, on the last day I was supposed to be out of town, I snuck into the house while Laura was at work and used a magic marker to erase my face from every photo in the dozen or so albums Laura had taken over the years. Having never looked through them in their entirety before, I was surprised by the low percentage of photos I was in, no more than 15%. I also found two photographs that I had never seen before, and even if I had seen them, I probably would have considered them innocent. They were Laura, Gina, Grace, Angela, and, drumroll, Pierrot. I scanned these photographs and made high-quality photocopies before returning them to the album, crossing them out with a black marker, indicating Pierrot with an arrow, and signing them, The Love of Laura's Life. Laura told me two days after I returned from my business trip that she had to go to Chicago from the morning of the 15th to the afternoon of the 19th. When I expressed my disappointment that she would not be with me for my birthday and offered to accompany her, she calmly, apparently counting on my reaction, objected, saying that it was on business, but that she would take me to the resort next weekend and will make amends in a way I've never experienced before. As for all parts one, three, and four, this was a particularly risky part of my plan. The rest, especially after I got comfortable with the art appraiser and hired one, I was quite confident would fall into place. The risky part was talking to Grace. I decided that I needed to meet Grace face to face. So as soon as I dropped Laura off at the airport on the morning of the 15th, I drove about 250 kilometers from Columbus to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, where Grace was studying chemical engineering. Why Grace and not Angela? Although both girls were much more with their mother than with me, Grace was much more like me at least in terms of how her brain worked, than Angela. Neither Angels nor Laura could ever imagine a course of study in chemical engineering. Of course, very close to my chemistry degrees. Besides, Grace had a harder time lying than either Angela or Laura, and while her refusal to tell me about Laura's affair with Pierrot suggested otherwise, she may or may not have been more concerned with family than Angela. I called Grace on her cell phone when I was about halfway there. She really seemed excited about the meeting. I told her I would take her to a real restaurant for a late lunch. We met at a restaurant of her choice, about a kilometer from campus, and took a secluded table. After we ate, I said, I need to talk to you about something very serious, Grace. A puzzled expression appeared on her face. Are you okay, Dad? Physically, yes, but emotionally... Despite the obvious lack of external manifestations, I'm a wreck. However, before I talk to you, I want you to promise that you won't tell anyone about this, including your mom and Angela, until the day after my birthday. Do you promise? I said, raising my hand in the I swear position after asking, Do you promise? Wow, that sounds serious, she gulped. Okay, Dad, I promise. I swear, she said raising her hand and trying to force a smile. I found out about your mother's love affair with Piero Romano and trying to decide whether to divorce her, I blurted out. Oh no, daddy, she exclaimed, putting her hand to her mouth, and tears instantly appeared in her eyes. There is only one hope. I need to find out everything you know about this, and I need you to do a DNA test. What? she exclaimed, before being on the verge of a complete breakdown. I realize that a restaurant is not the right place for this. I told her to meet me outside, and after I paid the bill, we would go to my car. I found the waitress, paid cash, and left a $20 tip, and found Grace, still in tears, on the sidewalk. As soon as we got into my car, I said, Okay, Grace, spit it out. The continued existence of our family depends on this. After several minutes of sobbing, during which she could not get anything out of her mouth, and I just looked at her, she began to speak. I didn't realize that Mom was sleeping with Piero, or Uncle Piero, as we were told to call him, until I was twelve. 
despite the displays of affection every time we were in Chicago, especially at Christmas. I know this from the comments Angela made that she knew before, but I wasn't sophisticated enough to understand it. I talked to my mom. She said it was mature, that she was in love with two men, and that I will understand when I grow up, that you should never find out, because it could mean the end of our family, because you were too unemotional, I think that's the word she used, to describe you. So I swore to secrecy. Grace paused again for a moment and then continued. I hoped that everything would end at Piero's funeral and that you would never know. After she made a fool of herself at his coffin, I came face to face with her again. I told her that if she had just jumped into the arms of someone else, I would have told you the whole story. She slapped me and asked how I could think of her like that, that she loved Piero and loved you, and there will be no one else. She simply had to honor Piero's memory. I believed her and prayed that this day, when you find out, would never come, because I am sure that she will not have another love or even a sexual affair. I pressed her for more information until I decided it would be counterproductive to get more. She, as I had hoped, was still in a state of mental anguish when I surprised her with the second reason for my visit. I hope to improve my relationship with your mother, Grace, and what you told me will help. However, I need one more thing. I need us to submit DNA samples to verify that you are my biological daughter. No, Daddy, no, she screamed. You are my only father. I know that I am your father, I answered, but I need to know if I am your biological father too. Let me wet your cheek. I'll blot mine and we'll put them in this envelope, I said, taking a large envelope from the back seat, and together we'll send it to the testing laboratory. She protested a little more, but eventually agreed. I wet her cheek. Then I blotted mine. I pretended to drop the sealed tampon on the floor of the car and then took another one from under the seat to take its place. She never noticed. I showed her the letter in an envelope addressed to the laboratory. She saw two swab containers in the envelope, so I sealed it. The instructions in the letter where to send the results both directly to Grace and to me. As I drove her back to campus, she watched as I dropped an envelope into the express mailbox along the way. When we hugged goodbye, she begged, Promise that you will forgive your mother and everything will work out for you. I can't promise now because I don't lie like she does. However, you did your part to increase the chances of it working. Now remember, don't tell anyone about our conversation until the 19th at the earliest. I promised, she smiled. Then she paused. There's... Uh, something else. I have to tell you. Mom and Angela will be at the Chicago exhibition of Pierrot's work, some of which are photographs of Mom, on your birthday. She told me that she was sorry that it had turned out this way, but that she had to be present because the works that she had inherited from Pierrot in his will would be exhibited. She wanted me to come too, but I had too much work to do at school. I smiled and answered as nonchalantly as I could. I know. Thanks for your honesty. We hugged again and she left. She didn't see the tears I shed, knowing that my relationship with Angela was now as dead as the one with Laura, but not yet deciding whether I could save it with Grace. Grace didn't know that I had recorded our conversation in the car. There was one thing Grace didn't know, which would hurt her and was part of the fourth part of my plan. The tampon I placed in the envelope that supposedly belonged to me belonged to an Italian-born janitor who worked in my office building and whom I had been friends with for many years. I promised to pay for his pedigree to be determined as a birthday present for him. He didn't even ask why I needed three strokes instead of one. The one I sent to test his heritage showed him to be over 80% Italian with some Eastern and Western European blood thrown in, which made him happy. Why did I put an Italian's DNA in something that was supposed to be tested instead of my own? Because I wanted everyone to hurt. The reason I used Italian is that during DNA testing they can, even when comparing two sets, figure out the ancestry of both authors, and since Piero was Italian, I wanted everyone to conclude that he was the father of Grace, and, if I can figure it out, Angela. I crossed my fingers that Grace wouldn't tell. I spoke to her on the phone on the 16th and 18th, and she promised she didn't, 
and since I hadn't heard anything from Laura, I was sure it was true. Around 11 p.m. on the 16th, Roberto Milan emailed me photographs of the relevant parts of the Romano exhibition. They hit me deeper than I thought. I shook like a leaf and sobbed while looking through them. It was a college or series of ten photographs, increasing in size from the first to the last. They all had Romano's hallmarks, including the last two stunning effects of Romano's artistry. The series was called Natale Amore, Christmas Love. What initially broke my heart were the first two episodes, which featured two girls, in front of a photograph of a woman who was undoubtedly Laura. While the girls' faces were a bulky blur, now from their hairstyles, what they were wearing. Christmas gifts from my mom and relative sizes, it was safe to say that these were Angela and Grace when they were about 9 and 11. In the second photo of the first two, one of Laura's breasts was exposed, and she had a look that could only be described as, Have sex with me. Over the next three episodes, Laura wore less and less clothing until the last episode saw her naked. The second episode started again with a photo with the girls in the background. Somewhat older this time, with the last four being increasingly risque until the second to last one, which featured Laura in an extremely sexy frontal nude pose, and the last one where it was clearly implied that she had had sex. After I threw up, drank some ginger ale, and had a good cry, I looked at the photos again. If they weren't breaking my heart, I'd have to say that the last two photos were probably the best of their kind I've ever seen. I have read the text accompanying Roberto Milan's report. Sorry, I know this will be hard for you. The collection is worth at least $300,000, most likely $500,000. The penultimate photograph alone would have fetched $125,000, $175,000 if sold separately. The last two photos are the best execution of Romano's artistry effects in history, not only in my opinion, but also in the opinion of at least four other appraisers and art critics whose conversations I overheard. I asked Gina if there was anything for sale. She put me in touch with the owner in Pierrot's will, unsurprisingly, Laura. Laura said they were not currently for sale because they were priceless, and that the four photographs of her completely naked would not be sold until after her death. I wouldn't want the general public, and especially my husband, to see me like this while I'm alive, she said, especially my husband, with a laugh. Even though he was doing his job, he might as well have stripped me of my dignity. I have her on tape, were the last words of his email, accompanied by a frowning emoticon. I emailed a digital form of my recording of what Grace said, as well as Roberto's photos and words, to my lawyer, Gail Schiff. She called me at 7.30 a.m. on the 17th. Obviously, your petition for divorce is based on an allegation of adultery. A law enforcement officer will be serving Laura at the reception tomorrow evening. I need to add something, I said. I'll send this so you can send it to your process server along with your divorce papers. I handed Gail the envelope addressed to Angela. The envelope contained a letter from me, a cheek swab from an Italian janitor a container of a new swab, and an express mail envelope addressed to the DNA lab with instructions attached. The letter from me to Angela said, Angela, if there is any hope that you and I will have a relationship in the future, there is one thing you must do for me. You need to take a swab from the inside of your cheek, put it in an envelope addressed to the laboratory DNA, which already contains my swab, and send the envelope by express mail. As you can see, the laboratory has instructions to send the results directly to you to the school, as well as to me. Maybe you don't want a relationship with me in the future. However, you still need to do as I ask, because if you don't, I will make sure my money is tied to it, and you can say goodbye to twitchin', room and board, and freshman and senior year expenses at that expensive private colleagues you attend. So, even if you hate me as much as your actions and inactions towards me in the past would suggest, it is in your best interest to do what I ask. Grace has already complied with the request. Your father, Grant Auster. I was glad I wasn't there when the scandal broke in Chicago on my birthday. The process server told Gail that Laura and Angela were smiling broadly as they interacted with the public around 9 p.m. on the 18th. They were puzzled when... The law enforcement officer handed them the envelopes because the processing server who was with him 
was taking photographs. They opened the envelopes on the spot. The law enforcement officer left, but the process server stayed, taking more photos until he was kicked out. The photos he emailed to Gail and Gail to me showed Laura sinking lower and lower to the ground, eventually landing in the fetal position, with Angela first distraught, then angry. She tried to tend to her prostrate mother. Really ruined the holiday? was the final cryptic comment from the processing server in the email accompanying the photos, with a smiling emoji attached. Angela called me on the morning of the 19th, expressing her disgust at the way I submitted this to the newspapers. To which I replied, Tough traitor, tell that to someone who cares. I have never spoken to her in such words in my life. She said, I'm not inclined to do this DNA thing. Want to find out who your biological father is and not the idiot who supported you all these years? I asked sarcastically. You are my father, she answered. Maybe, maybe not, I replied. However, one thing is certain. I've already asked my lawyer to freeze all of your mother's accounts and mine. I can assure you that there will be no money for your education in the future, or even for living expenses since you turned 20, unless you mail this envelope with your tampon. Now that I think about it, I'd need a video of you swabbing your cheek, putting it in an envelope, and mailing it. All at the same time to believe you, given the lies you've told me over the years. It's cruel. I didn't lie to you, she growled. Oh, really? I giggled. But you didn't tell the whole truth, did you? Your sister is repentant and will get her tuition paid. Obviously, you're just as much of a nasty bitch as your mother, so I'm not going to waste my time discussing this with you, because you make me sick. Either do as I say and email me the video, or this is the last conversation we'll ever have in your life. With these words, I hung up. It's nice to have a landline where you can make a statement by hanging up rather than just pressing that red button with no emphasis on your cell phone. The nasty bitch mother made no attempt to call me on the 18th, 21st, and probably delayed her return to Columbus by two days, out of sympathy for her bosom friend, Gina. The excitement at the exhibition on the 18th was noted not only in two major Chicago newspapers, but also in two national art publications. In each of them, there appeared a photograph of Laura lying down, apparently sold to him by the process server. I laughed heartily in between the urges to empty the contents of my stomach, Apparently the nasty bitch actually came to the house, which as far as I could tell was no longer a house, on the 22nd. I only know because the envelope I left on the new front door, steel, with a reinforced frame and a replacement lock just like the side and back doors, was no longer there and my lawyer left a message on my cell phone saying, we need to talk. The envelope was addressed to nasty fucking cheater and I assumed Laura must have known it was her. My internal message was brief. Hey, bitch, have your lawyer contact mine to see when you can pick up your personal belongings. The sooner we sell the house and end our sham marriage, the better. I will fight every attempt you make to return to this house until it is sold. Do something decent for the first time in our farcical relationship. Don't resist it. Not that you would resist for any other reasons than economic ones, since you have no love or respect for me. Your former ignorant grant. P.S. The doors are locked. Any unauthorized entry will result in the destruction of all your previous family albums. Lawyers needed to appear in court to decide something regarding living conditions. I probably could have gotten exactly what I wanted if I hadn't written this P.S. in the note. But I couldn't help it. In the end, we, through our lawyers, agreed to vacate the house and put it up for sale immediately. In this case... The amount of our expenses for temporary housing will be taken into account when dividing property. Laura tried to be difficult in negotiations about money, but she was unable to negotiate because she had purchased her precious photographs from Pierrot while we were still married. When I asked for five photos, she could choose one, then me, etc., until all ten were shared. According to her lawyer, she became hysterical, especially since by that time she had seen how I had retouched family photo albums. At Laura's insistence, we had Romano's photographs appraised, one by an appraiser she hired, and the other by a neutral appraiser. 
The funny thing is that Romano's photo was the lowest priced and cost her $200,000 more than if she had agreed with his estimate. Since this had a big impact on what she would end up with, she offered me two photos, the ones she had chosen. However, she rescinded the offer when I asked my lawyer to tell her that I agreed, as long as she took them to a local landfill and watched what I did with them. When all was said and done, by the time the divorce proceedings were finalized, Laura was left with her personal belongings, including all of her albums. She was angry that I didn't want any of it, half the furniture and a quarter of the sale price of the house. Nothing more, including no alimony, but a suspended prison sentence. More on that later. We did agree to share all of Grace and Angela's college expenses until they graduated, but nothing more. As for Angela and Grace, as expected, the DNA test results showed that they were not my biological daughters. This made Laura so angry that she almost had a stroke. I spoke to Grace about this rather than Angela, who complied with my request solely to pay for her college expenses and seemed content to have no further relationship with me. Dad, Mom says the results are wrong. She said that while she was married to you, she never had sex with anyone other than you and Pierrot, and that she didn't even meet Pierrot before I was born. Then why is your father of Italian descent like Piero, while I am Dutch on both sides of my family? Your mother has demonstrated that she is a pathological liar. She lied to me about loving me throughout the 24-plus years of our relationship. So why should you believe that everything she says is true? She says she wants another DNA test. This will not happen because you are not minor children, and this has nothing to do with the divorce. I just wanted to know for myself and for you and Angela to know the truth. Besides, you saw how I blotted my cheek and put the tampon in an envelope, and then sent it myself. Dad, Mom also wants to talk to you personally. She says she made the request through her lawyer several times, but she's not even sure your lawyer conveyed the message to you. Because she never received an answer. She didn't get an answer because I told my lawyer to ignore her request. What reason could I have to talk to this woman? Dad, please don't call her that in front of me. I still love her despite her flaws. I'm asking you for a favor, please. Talk to her for an hour, please. Sorry, Grace. I can't help it. I have forgiven you and would like to be in a relationship with you, but there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that would make me want to talk to her. Now about Laura's suspended prison sentence and receiving only a quarter of the proceeds from the sale of the house. After my phone conversation with Grace about the DNA test and Laura's desire to talk to me, she did something stupid. I thought she might be up to something, so I connected and walked around with a panic button connected directly to the private security company. One night, a woman knocked on the door of the apartment I was renting during divorce proceedings while the final financial details were worked out. I saw two big guys and Laura standing off to the side when I looked through the peephole. As soon as I opened the door, two big guys burst in and grabbed me, but not before I pressed my silent panic button. As soon as they grabbed me, they yanked me onto a chair and tied me to it while Laura walked in and the other woman walked away. Grant, I'm sorry I had to do this, but you refused to meet with me and refused to repeat the DNA test, which we both know is wrong. Then she started talking some hilarious nonsense about how she had always loved me and that she just loved Pierrot into the bargain, that her heart was big enough for both of us. She realized that we had passed the point of reconciliation, but she just wanted to ease her soul. While talking to me, she was holding a tampon in her hands. Apparently, she was going to forcefully take a DNA sample from me. She was really annoyed that I didn't verbally respond to anything she said. I refused to even acknowledge her presence, trying my best to avoid eye contact. Luckily, just as she was about to order two of her goons to open my mouth for a DNA swab, my panic button went off. The security company called the police, and three cops, with guns drawn, burst into the house. They found me tied up, and one of the villains had an illegal weapon in his trouser pocket. I explained the situation where the cops were holding the three of them at gunpoint. The cops ignored Laura's plea to just let them go. They didn't mean to harm me. They arrested three of them. A minor assault didn't sit well with the judge in our divorce case. 
After she made it clear that if she had to rule, it would be really bad for Laura, I received the division of property and other considerations outlined above. The criminal court took pity on Laura because it was her first offense. She received two years probation and a $10,000 fine, which was only from her share of the family property. Things didn't work out so well for the two guys because they had dark histories. One received a year in prison before parole is possible, and the one who had an illegal weapon received five years before parole is possible. The fourth part of my plan did not end when the divorce became final, although I do not admit here or anywhere else that I had anything to do with it. Just karma. That's what I always answer when they ask me about it. Eighteen months after the divorce was final, I was on a Caribbean cruise with a 32-year-old hot little divorcee who loved to be treated properly and richly and loved sex even more. She was too much like Laura at that age and too hot-tempered for me to seek a permanent relationship with her. But it was fun to be with her, even though she wears me out with sex. While I was having fun on the cruise, Laura's apartment was broken into while she was at work. The apartment was destroyed. Some things were stolen, including the second most provocative and valuable photograph of Laura Romano, the most valuable and provocative she lent for a long time to an art gallery so it was not in her apartment. However, more items were destroyed than stolen, including seven of the eight remaining photographs of Romano and all but the two earliest family photo albums. Of course, I was a suspect when I returned. Obviously, I couldn't do it myself because I was on a cruise 3,000 kilometers away, but Laura insisted to the cops that I pay someone to do it. When the police approached me, and as soon as they started asking questions that indicated that I was a suspect, I refused to talk to them and hired a criminal lawyer. After searching my phone and financial records, which of course did not include two cashed bearer bonds that were never part of the divorce estate, they could find no indication that I could pay anyone for this, and there was no connection they could find with anyone who was capable of it. Do what has been done. I got the distinct impression that six months after their first contact with me, the cops had all but given up, although I'm sure Laura continued to pester them. As soon as the statute of limitations expired, I threw a party. My It's Finally Over party was attended mostly by friends. My parents were no longer alive, but there were my brother, his wife, my two nephews, my new love interest, Melody, a widow my age, two grown children, Melody and Grace her husband, and my granddaughter. I did not then and now do not have any relationship with Angela. I was not invited to her wedding and would not have gone even if I had. However, I heard from Grace that Angela's husband caught her cheating and she is in the early stages of divorce proceedings. Laura gave Grace an ultimatum, either break all ties with me or with her. To everyone's surprise, including mine, she chose me, probably because she was convinced that Laura, as I thought of her, was a pathological liar. More importantly, Grace realized how terrible it was that her mother threw information about her relationship with her lover in her daughter's face and forced them to lie to cover up her infidelity. Grace didn't want her children to face this kind of attitude, there has only been one thing that has caused friction between Grace and I over the past five years. I told her the truth about DNA testing. At first she was angry with me, but she forgave me. Just as I have forgiven her for her duplicity over the years, she was actually very happy that I was her biological father. I had another DNA test done to prove it in addition to the practical one. I really believe Laura moved to Chicago, but I don't know for sure. And more importantly, I don't give a damn. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one.